Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. This is episode 98 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we talk with Nancy Bell, garden coach and education coordinator at Gateway Garden Center in Hawkinson, Delaware, about native vines for the mid-Atlantic United States. The plant profile is on lungwort, and I share what's going on in the garden, as well as some upcoming local gardening events. You'll especially want to hear Nancy's advice for vines that do well in shade and that are good for foliage, not just for flowers. This episode, we're joined by Nancy Bell. She's the Education and Garden Coach Coordinator at Gateway Garden Center in Hokesson, Delaware. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Great to have you. So our topic today is all things native vines. But before we dive into all those things that grow up and down (laughs) and all around, maybe scramble across the forest floor as well. um, Let's talk a little bit about Nancy and get to know you. So we always like to ask, were you born with chlorophyll in your veins? Did you have a green thumb from the beginning? Um, I wouldn't say that I was born with chlorophyll in my veins, but I was certainly born with a magnetic draw to nature. Um, I was born in Philadelphia in the Mayfair section of Philadelphia, and there's an awful lot of concrete and not a whole lot of wildlife. There are street trees, but my mother saw that I was attracted to insects and birds, and she would take me on walks and help me identify trees uh, by their leaves, by their fruit, by their bark. And it got to where I could identify a tree even in winter, partly because I, I remembered where it was, but because I was observing the different attributes of it in different seasons. And I am really glad that she did nurture that and took the time to do it because by the time we moved out of Philadelphia, I was 10. And I was the oldest of seven kids. So she was a very busy woman. And when we moved from Philadelphia to the suburbs, I felt like I had landed in heaven. It was a new development. There were streams nearby. There were fields. There was a farmer just a few blocks from where our house was, Farmer Hoy. He encouraged the kids to play in the fields. And there was one field that was fallow that he mowed down so that we could play baseball. He didn't mind us running in his fields. By that point, he was a hog farmer and he did not discourage us from coming and visiting the hogs. We were allowed to climb in his orchards, which he really wasn't really harvesting from anymore. So for me, it was idyllic. Now, the thing that my mother did was She saw my curiosity and she allowed me to bring anything home that I found as long as it went back to its home by sundown. That was the deal. And so that made me as an 11, 12 year old, really pay attention to the surroundings in which I was finding these things. I did find out that my mother had a fear of spiders when I brought home a big black and yellow spider (laughs) in a tin can. Um, I found out that my grandmother had a fear of snakes when I brought home a garter snake. Um, But I did carefully look for where these creatures were located and couldn't help but notice the flowers that, you know, the different butterflies were landing on. Um, I loved damselflies, dragonflies, um, caught mud puppies and salamanders. You know, it was me with my butterfly net running all over the place, excited. As I got older, well, actually, even in that first year, um, because we had the space, my mom allowed each of us to have our own little garden. And my little garden in the back, I planted with um, Cosmos bright, bright lights and bachelor's buttons. 
And I would love bringing in these little bouquets of bright flowers in the middle of the summertime. So that's kind of where it got started. And then as I got my first home, I began experimenting and reading. And it was a hobby for me up until the time I turned 50, actually just a little bit before that. In 2004, I applied to and was accepted into the Master Gardener program at the University of Delaware. And that was my first step into beginning to formalize what was a love and a hobby. And from there, I got to Gateway as a job in 2007. And at Gateway, Steve and Peg Castorani encouraged their staff to take continuing education classes. At that time, only Longwood in our area was offering them. Mount Cuba does now too. And I took the long, I took every Longwood class I could take and I got my certificates in ornamental horticulture level one, two, almost finished three, and my landscape design certificate from there. And then Longwood had me as a plant walk instructor. That was a side job while I was still working at Gateway. I've been at Gateway now 15 years and truly consider myself to be a Gateway product. Uh, because they have encouraged and enabled me to continue to go and grow. And so maybe now I do have chlorophyll in my veins. <laughs> I would say mostly, mostly um, it's a passion for native plants, but I'm not strictly native plants. I don't allow thugs in my garden, whether it's native or non-native. And some things are too aggressive to have in the average home garden. Um, Essentially, I consider it peaceful coexistence. That's what I'm looking for. The plants that I have in my garden that are non-native are typically things like hellebores that bloom before um, a lot of our natives even get going. And I have um, another non-native that I'm very impressed with, which is uh, calamantha, which blooms almost the entire summer. And I can't believe the number of pollinators that are on it. So the choices that I make are when it's non-native, it's specifically to um, being productive in my garden. So yes, um, I am a big native plant pusher, if you will. Uh, my job at the garden center is as the education coordinator, which be, well, while we were going through COVID, we didn't do workshops. I was managing workshops and presenting a lot of workshops at the garden center, but also helping to coordinate uh, workshops put on by other people. And then as a garden coach, I go to people's homes and give them advice on site, looking at the situations that they have in their home gardens and telling them what would be appropriate. And whenever I can, I'm going to suggest a native plant because it's just so much better for the environment. But native plants aren't always the answer. Sometimes you have to combine um, other non-natives, especially when you're dealing with deer. You know, not everything can be native and, and achieve what the homeowner is looking for. So in that case, then I'm looking for the best blend of plants that are going to do the least harm. You know, so I'm not ever going to recommend a Bradford pear or a burning bush or, or plants like that that have proven to be invasive. I'm going to pick from things that are well behaved and not escape the garden. Excellent. So a few things I wanted to drill down a little bit on your story. And first, because we have listeners from all over the world, uh, mainly here in the Mid-Atlantic, but I'm betting that there are some who don't even know where Delaware is. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> let's describe the state of Delaware in relation to the rest of the East Coast. The state of Delaware is the second next to smallest state in the country. It's on the East Coast and it's located um, between Washington and Philadelphia. We're, we're just below Philadelphia. And um, I am a transplant to Delaware from Pennsylvania. Um, and I have found that I have really, really appreciated this state of Delaware. I've been here 22 years now. And I love 
the smallness of it, the interconnectedness of it. It's a really wonderful place that a lot of people just don't even really know about. So mm -hmm. it's wonderful. Yeah. It's like our little mid-Atlantic secret there. It and is. it, it h hugs the coastline, has a lot of coastline. It's fairly fertile ground, um, coastal plain, and mainly um, at sea level. And I was going to just have a side note about Mount Cuba that it's basically a large hill. Don't don't yeah. picture the Rockies or anything like that. Yeah, it's funny. I um, <laughs> I actually trekked to Mount Everest base camp and it was hard to get the training in because we're mostly at sea level. So for me, it was a drastic, drastic change. But um, Delaware has a lot to offer. And when it, you get into northern Delaware, you're getting away from the coastal plain and you're coming into um, the hill country, but it is hill country. It's not mountains, um, but beautiful rolling uh, landscapes. Mm -hmm. With lots of nice stream valleys going through it and beautiful mm -hmm. wooded lots. So imagine uh, just taking a leisurely Sunday drive up and through those is, is very beautiful. And I was also going to say about Delaware and the fertile soil there. So it has University of Delaware, which you said you took your master gardener program at. Um, there are a lot of farmers there, a lot of um, agricultural research being done. And of course, a lot of garden centers, just like Gateway. Um, and a lot of people doing their shopping coming across from Pennsylvania and Maryland or down from New Jersey as well for their plant shopping down there. That's true. But I would say not a lot of places just like Gateway. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm just going to put a pause on there for a minute because Gateway has an emphasis on native plants and has done for a very long time. Uh, we promoted the American Beauties brand of native plants from the get go, partly because our owner, Steve Castorani, um, is a co-owner of that brand. But it's because it, it's been understood by our owners of just how important the impact of native plants are. And we will go the extra mile for our customers in that if we don't have a plant in stock, we will try to find it for them and let them know. And I don't know that a lot of places do that. Okay, so I feel very proud of who we are and what we do. Hmm. And I'm hearing a lot of echoes from our recent podcast episode with Heather Wheatley and how Homestead Gardens operates there and does a lot of continuing education. Same thing with Gateway. And I know that um, you and Heather are friends and yeah. I wouldn't call it competitors. I would say if we're going to shop at one, we're going to shop at both. Yeah, I don't see it. I don't see it as a competition. It's um, there is, you know, there for one thing, there's enough difference, but the the emphasis that she has on native plants too, the understanding that she has, you know, when you have people like that in the industry pulling forward for the same things, it's lifting all boats. It's it's raising the tide of consciousness in our customers and helping them to learn their way down the road of making their yards more inviting to wildlife. Exactly. And so let's define a few of our terms. So first we'll define native and then we'll talk about aggressive, invasive, and thug. But let's start off with how you define native plant. So for me, in my garden, it's native to the mid-Atlantic region. Um, but the great thing is, as people learn more about native plants, they can choose to be even more and more drilled down to things that are exactly native to their state, to their region. Um, there may be some things that aren't native to Delaware, but are native to Pennsylvania. And yet it's close enough that it's still going to have the same beneficial effects on, on the insects and the birds and, uh, and other animals. So for me, it's native to the mid-Atlantic region. But the wonderful thing is each person individually gets to decide how closely they drill down into um, what strictly is native. Mm -hmm. And we also have to remember, of course, that these state lines, these political lines are very arbitrary, that there was nothing there that said a plant, you know, 
was 15 feet away found in Pennsylvania versus Delaware versus Maryland versus Washington DC, et cetera. Um, and just because it wasn't documented that it was there originally doesn't mean it wasn't. It's just that there isn't current proof that that, that grew there. Yes, exactly. And then when we come to my turn, so invasive, the term invasive really applies to a non-native plant that is taking over areas that should be occupied by native plants. And it makes, it makes a huge difference. Um, right now, the Bradford pear in our area is coming into bloom. And it's shocking when you drive down the highways and you see just how much of it there is, and then realize that that area is becoming sterile as far as being a food source for native insects, okay? Bradford pear, I think maybe has five, if that species of Lepidoptera, which are the butterfly and moth group, where it supports the caterpillars as a larval host. Where that makes a huge, huge impact is our birds when they're raising their babies. Our birds are feeding their babies live food. Growing babies need protein and they get it in the form of insects. Even our seed eating birds like the cardinals are feeding their babies live food. And if you think about a caterpillar as a perfect baby food, it's squishy, it's soft, it's easy for the parent to stuff it down their mouth you begin to realize that if a brad prepare only supports five species and an oak supports like 550 species, there's a drastic change in how much insect life is being supported. And that affects our birds as they're raising their babies in, in a very big way. It's not surprising that we've had a decline in our songbird population steadily over the last 50 years. It's be, it goes, goes back to how much we've changed the environment by putting in housing, but not only that, by bringing in these non-native plants that then have escaped in a terrible way and are crowding out the native plants because our insects, our native insects eat the native plants. They have co-evolved with them. Plants don't wanna be eaten. They produce enzymes to keep that from happening. So when you have a big tree that is only supporting five versus a big tree that's supporting 550 species, you can begin to get a grasp on just how detrimental the impact is. Um, Gateway 10 years ago eliminated Bradford pear and um, burning bush uh, as it began to be really realized the detrimental effect. And as those, that information comes out, we stop, we stop selling those plants. And we still have people who come in and ask for them, but we take the time to explain to them why we don't. And most of the time people are surprised, but they're happy to understand. I think, yeah, customer education is so important there. And so I do hear the term used interchangeably with aggressive. And so some people will call certain native plants invasive um, because they are aggressive or thug-like in behavior, which, you know, in English, those can be interchangeable terms, but mm -hmm. it means something specific when we're talking about natives and non-natives. Correct. Invasive applies to non-native, but I will use the terms interchangeably of aggressive or thug-like for our non-natives. I mean, there are just some, I mean, for our natives, I'm sorry. Um, there are some of our plants that can be very aggressive. I think specifically of the trumpet vine. Um, the trumpet vine, I love it. I love the way it looks. Um, I love that it brings hummingbirds. However, it, it gets like 30 to 40 feet tall or can, but its root structure can go out that far. And as it moves out that far, it sends up suckers that then become vines and it can totally take over an area. So it is in no way suited for a typical homeowner's house. That's what <laughs> yeah, I, I mean. I have to laugh at that one because I have done that to myself and probably to the future homeowners of my home <laughs> for the next three or four generations. They're going to be seeing trumpet vine coming up. Yeah. So that's that's what I mean. But there are other good native alternatives 
that are better behaved and you can still get the beauty out of them. Like the, um, uh, the native coral honeysuckle, it's the, the native honeysuckle. And depending on how much room you wanna cover, there are selections uh, of those natives that can get big. Um, like I love John Clayton. John Clayton is a beautiful yellow form and even the, the foliage on it is like a blue green color. It, but it wants to get like 20 feet and that can be too big for some places. There's the, a red form called Alabama Crimson and, and there's another one Magnifica and they also get kind of that size. There's another selection called Major Wheeler which I love and I have in a couple places at my house. And I'm amazed at how reliably it blooms through the whole summer. It's a big hummingbird draw. It holds its leaves for a long time into the fall and it's one of the earliest of the vines to bloom. There's another one that blooms sooner, um, but of the coral honeysuckles, it's the first one to get going and it's very reliably disease resistant too. And so for most native vines that we're going to be discussing in this session, we're talking about flowering vines, but are there some that we're going to grow just for foliage interest? Um, the one, maybe two, two that I can think of that would work that way. One would be the pipe vine, which because the flowers are so small and insignificant, you don't really see them unless you're up close and into the plant and they look like a Dutchman's pipe. That's, that's why it has that name. But they are a larval host plant for the pipe vine swallowtail, which is this big, gorgeous swallowtail butterfly. And those big ones, I think of them as living jewels. And I love to see them come in my garden and I deliberately try to bring them into my garden. So that's one that I would say you would grow for foliage more than for the flower, but you can get into the plant and appreciate the flower. Um, the other one that I would think of would be the um, oh, Virginia creeper. And the Virginia creeper, I like it. I actually have it going up in ash mm -hmm. um, in my yard. Unfortunately, it's gonna have to come down within the next year or two because my ashes, I think it's got borer. Um, but it lives nicely alongside that ash tree. And the ash, my ash tends to drop its leaves pretty early in the fall, but the het, um, Virginia creeper turns this gorgeous, gorgeous red in the fall and gives me another nice kind of show up there, as well as I don't, I don't ever see or appreciate the berries on it, but I'm sure my birds do. Mm -hmm. So those yeah. would be the two that I can think of that would be grown primarily for foliage. Mm -hmm. I would say I would love Virginia creepers kind of peachy tones that it turns before it turns that crimson that's my favorite yeah. stage of Virginia creeper and yeah. then it is deciduous so it does drop the foliage but then you get those nice kind of vibrant stems throughout the winter time so I don't mind that too much right well and then there's um the Carolina jessamine gelsemium um that is semi evergreen so a little further south from where I am you would have a lot more evergreen foliage from it. Um, so you could consider it a plant that you would grow for its foliage. Mm -hmm. But right now it's coming into flower and it's got these beautiful yellow trumpet shaped flowers. And of course, all of these different vines uh, will host a number of insects as a, as a host plant too. So they have that, that added benefit. Mm -hmm. And so you were talking about that Virginia uh, creeper could have some seeds that would support the birds. That made me think of another foliage native vine, and that is poison ivy. And that could be gorgeous, but yeah, it's not one that a lot of people welcome in their garden, but the birds do love the berries from it. They do. And it is, it, it can be a beautiful vine. It's just one that you need to stay yards away from. Um, my first encounter that I can remember with uh, poison ivy was when I was um, that, that new house that we had moved to in the suburbs, I was taking a shortcut to a shopping center and there was an area that had been bulldozed and they were burning all of the brush. Well, I had a flannel shirt on that was open at the neck and the next day it turned, I had poison ivy 
on my hands, on my neck, on my face, and it got down into my throat because that oil can be carried on smoke. So I, <laughs> I have a very, you know, um, I have a radar when it comes to poison ivy. It does, its berries actually are very good for our local birds. They, it has a lot of uh, fats to it. So it's a very good plant to have around for the birds, but it really doesn't belong in a home setting. Very true. So let's turn to talk about some of your favorite native vines for a garden setting. So if somebody wanted to start off with a few native vines um, in their garden, what would be some great ones for beginners? So some of these are not, so the coral honeysuckle that I, that I talked about first um, is, is a definite goer. Um, it's really good. The gelsimium or Carolina jessamine, is really nice. It stays on the, um, it maybe gets 10 feet tall, but its foliage is glossy and attractive. And as we said, it's, it's, it can be semi evergreen a little bit further south from where I am in Northern uh, Newcastle County. I like the native um, clematis, the clematis virginiana. It's not always easy to find, but it's worth looking for. It has beautiful white flowers. It can get up to 20 feet tall and it blooms from July into September. And is that the one that people sometimes confuse with the sweet autumn clematis because it blooms around the same time? How yeah. can we tell the difference between that one and the evasive sweet autumn one? Uh, I think that this one thing I think is the fragrance. Um, the sweet autumn clematis has a, has a more identifiable fragrance um, it does bloom a little bit later, and then you would be wanting to look at the leaves. Um, the native clematis is, has got a little bit more um, pointed to serrated leaves, where the sweet autumn clematis is a little more rounded. Um, but it would be, if you're trying to identify it, it's readily identifiable by, you know, Googling it and then um, doing a comparison of the leaf structure because the leaves are very, very different. Mm -hmm. And there's another clematis that I believe is native to the region. Uh, Vi I want to say Viorana is how it's pronounced, or vase vine is, is I think the common name for that. That's my personal favorite native vine. It's, it's beautiful. And they have that at Mount Cuba Center and among their, um, they've got a big vine kind of trial area where you can look at these things side by side, which is great. It's, it's not, I haven't seen it readily available in the trade. So it's something that's really going to take some looking for, but it is gorgeous and different. It's, it's really unique looking. Uh, so it is very much worth it. There's another one that I like, um, which is the um, passion vine or passion flower. It is such an exotic looking flower. Um, if you, the Passiflora incarnata, which is native to our area and hardy in our range, um, it can get quite large. It can get to 20 feet. Um, and more. Its fruit is edible, um, which is nice too. But the, the bees, oh my goodness, when the, the bumblebees is usually who I see on it. And they just kind of, it, it looks like they're dancing around inside that <laughs> flower. Um, just a beautiful, beautiful, different kind of vine. That yeah. not, a people, not a lot of people realize that it's native too. No, because it looks so tropical and almost like otherworldly, like something you would see in a Star Trek episode, like that open face and that cross yeah. in the middle is so crazy looking that you're like, yeah. is that a plastic flower that you glued on this vine? <laughs> <laughs> but you'll also know it by the common name. You'll hear May Pop. Um, yes, that's one of them. another one. Yeah, is another word. And that's referring more to the fruit that you get at the end from that. Exactly, exactly. And then one that's not strictly a vine, it's a leaner, but it's vine-like. It's called Ampelaster carolinianus. It's the climbing aster, but it doesn't really climb. It, it like, so it doesn't have tendrils. It just kind of weaves its way and it can get some um, length to it. It can get between six and 12 feet tall, um, but it's another very pretty one, a late bloomer. So it's blooming in the fall, um, September into October. So it's there and available for, um, you know, kind of the last hurrah for the pollinators before they go into hibernation. 
but it's beautiful because it's totally covered in these white flowers that have a little bit of a pinkish blush, just a touch of it. It doesn't read as pink, but when you get up close to it, it's really quite beautiful. Hmm. So would you have to stake that or kind of train that on a shrub or something? What I've done is I've trained it up into a shrub and allowed it to kind of scramble along a fence line. Where I am in Northern Newcastle County, we're right at the upper edge of its hardiness zone. So further south, it's going to be more successful and get taller. Um, but it's it's definitely worth looking for. You would have to, you know, if people could um, have it go, you know, around a lamp at the end of their driveway if they had that. But you would want to run strings or fishing lines so that you could tuck it around because it's not going to be able to go up that on its own. Hmm. And I was going to ask for some of these other vines might take a little bit of pruning and training as well. Um, so I like that fishing line or or sometimes it's called monofilament line that's kind of invisible to the eye. I also like to go to the dollar store and get dental floss because uh -huh. I feel like that's cheap and easy to tie with. Um, and I find that if I use twine or garden string, squirrels inevitably chew through it they love to steal that <laughs> so but th they leave the dental floss especially minty dental floss alone oh that's a very good tip um there's another one that i really like but it would be better used if you have a tall tree like i have those ashes that i mentioned and that's the cross vine the bignonia the bignonia is really cool it has a um a flower very similar to the trumpet vine, um, but the coloring is different. Um, it can be yellows to oranges to almost a red. Um, it lives nicely with the tree, but it can get up to 250 feet tall. Um, the class that I'm going to be teaching at Mount Cuba Center on native vines will be going into the wooded area and you can see one that has made its way all the way up to the top of the tree, but it doesn't do it in such a way where it tries to pull the tree down, okay? It might be at 50 feet, it, it might be too big to put, what well, would be, to put on a trellis, but you could train it along a fence line if you wanted to. You could use that length to have it decorate along a, a long fence line if you wanted to do that. It would certainly lend itself to that. And again, having that trumpet-shaped flower that it has, uh, it would be very attractive to hummingbirds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen some um, trained up kind of over arbors or long pergolas because it does need that really strong support for it. It does. And it doesn't seem to be as uh, stoloniferous as, um, say, the, 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 uh, the trumpet vine. Um, it does come up a little bit, but not as vigorously. Um, and, and then kind of along that vein, there are a couple of native wisteria which they're better behaved than the Chinese wisteria, um, but they also can be stoloniferous. And so that needs some watching, but they're really quite beautiful in their own right. And the fact that they're native and not, give, not just giving you the same kind of flower that the Asian one is, but supporting a, a number of other species of insect makes it a better alternative to the Chinese wisteria or the Asian wisteria. Yeah, I just love that um, selection Amethyst Falls is such a yeah. beautiful cultivar and that's pretty readily available um, at nurseries and garden centers and some of the you know native wisteria if you put it up against the Asian one it's gonna it's gonna be drowned out. It would not be able to compete with it. Um, so yes, so that um, amethyst falls is the wisteria for testants. Um, there's another native one, a wisteria, the Canada one, uh, Kentucky, Kentucky wisteria, the microstaca. It has a little bit of a deeper blue to it than amethyst falls is a little more to the purple, but blue moon has a little bit more to the blue, um, but they do have a similar bigger uh, in a garden setting to the Asian, but they would be overwhelmed by it. You couldn't plant it in among uh, an Asian wisteria because it would it would just overwhelm it, take it over. Mm -hmm. And so for the Asian one, usually you plant it and it could take a good seven years 
until you get really good flowering on it and then it becomes a monster after that it does. It, um, it, it, very is, quickly yeah and for the the native one is that similar that you have to wait a few years till you get some good bloom you have to allow it to establish and you would want to you wouldn't expect it to be giving you sufficient bloom until maybe it's third or fourth year you've got to give it the time to establish but it is not as vigorous a um throwing up stems and taking over uh, mm -hmm. at that bottom layer it's more well behaved that way and is that the case for a lot of the native vines that you want to give them two or three years to get their roots established um, those would be, of course, all the perennial and woody ones. And I don't think we've discussed any annual vines yet in the natives. We haven't discussed any annual vines. And I'm quite frankly, I'm not as familiar with them, um, mm -hmm. you know, which ones would be native. Um, but I would say that for them, because they have a woody nature to them, you need to treat them differently than perennials. You need to treat them more like shrubs which take a good three years to establish at the root level. Um, perennials, they can get their feet in one to two years. Um, they're just a little quicker grower, but anything that has that more woody aspect to it, you really need to be patient with it and give it a good three years to establish. Um, and, and sometimes if you've gone through a severe droughty period where it's had a lot of heat stress, it may even take it an additional year. And I was also going to ask about shade versus sun. So I, I think that a lot of these that we're talking about, if you want really good flowering, say on the cross vine or the or the wisteria, or even the honeysuckle, you want to give it a bit more sun. But do they prefer morning sun and an afternoon shade? Is that the predominant? Most of them are understory plants. So certainly the cross vine is an understory. The ones that you're going to get the best flowering from and can be in full sun would be your coral honeysuckle, your wisteria, um, your clematis, trumpet vine. I mean, it's a, it's adaptable. Cli the climbing aster and the passion vine, you really would want to have these being in full sun if you can help it. They all can be pushed into a part shade situation. Um, the ones that do a little bit better uh, still really reliably bloom for you in that part shade would be your cross vine. Um, that's a that's a real goer in the part shade situation. The um, Virginia creeper does very well in that situation. Carolina jessamine is very tolerant of um, a part shade situation. Definitely blooms best in full sun. Yeah. So, but they're very. Um, the funny thing about these plants is they want to live and they're very adaptable. If your purpose in growing them is for the flowers, then looking to have them sited in more sun is gonna be really important. But if you have them in a part shade situation, they can still give you a really good performance. And along that route, that, that idea, you know, if you have sun on the Western side of your house, that's a part sun, some people call it a part shade area. These plants that are full sun plants are very able to handle that situation and will respond to it well because they have the robustness. Being a full sun plant, they can handle the intensity of sun when we get into the middle of summer. You think about hot, how, how hot life is in July and August. And even if it's that part sun situation, they are perfectly able to be ornamental and do well and succeed in that kind of light. And for pruning and controlling some of them, so for shaping or for just keeping them in check and not taking over the whole rest of your bed, uh, do you do annual pruning maybe in late winter or how do you um, uh, train most of them? So I have, for example, I've got my, um, uh, my coral honeysuckle in a couple of places going over arches. And I actually do some pruning on them in the summertime. If they start to come below the arch, I prune out those strays. And then it's not until it loses its, they lose their leaves in the fall that I can clearly see the structure. And that's when I want to get out and do a little bit of thinning because 
You don't want to let them just grow, grow, grow on top of themselves because that inhibits air circulation and it can set up a situation for disease. Um, I would say the same thing with um, the clematis, the climbing, the climbing aster, you'd want to do it after it finishes blooming. Uh, one native plant that we didn't talk about um, is the uh, grape, the Vitus labrusca. And that does very well in full sun, but can also be pushed into a part shade situation and, and then also give you a fair amount of fruit as well. Um, its flowering isn't the, you know, hey, look at me thing, but it gives you a wonderful fruit at the end of the season. I was going to ask if there would be any fruit left after the wildlife gets a hold of those grapevines. <laughs> well, my grapevines have worked out pretty well so far. What, what I did with my grape was um, we have a, a deck that comes off of our second story. And, you know, when you see grapes grown, you see these short stems, right? And then, they, then they're being grown laterally um, along wires. Well, we took that same concept and allowed our grapevine to grow up to the second story. And as it got up there, that's when we began to thin those lower branches out. But we did that kind of a spalier look up on the second level. And it would, the purpose was twofold, to give us privacy because that side of our deck is right near our neighbor's uh, master bedroom and we wanted to give them and us privacy. And then there was also the um, additional benefit of getting fruit. Now, once that vine got up there and it probably took it three years to get that high, and then the fourth year began to produce fruit, it produces such an abundance of fruit that I don't have to worry about sharing it with wildlife. My problem now is catching the spotted lanternflies, which are now attracted to it and have come into my area. Oh no, yeah, not good. But I was also gonna ask on those grapes, they're not gonna be the same grapes you get at the grocery store, right? Are they like thick skinned, um, dark? They are thicker skinned. Um, you can get it, Niagara is a, is a lighter color. It, mm -hmm. You can find it in a dark or a light form, but it is a thicker skin. And it's wonderful for making um, jelly out of, and even having some juice. Mm -hmm. I've got nice. five. I've got five grandkids. Okay, and I love um, having the native plants in the garden. My oldest granddaughter, Charlotte, the one time she came to visit, and right after she got here, she wanted to put on one of the princess dresses, which I have in the house. She put that on pulled on her pink wellies and said, Nanny, let's go catch bugs. And that's exactly what I wanted to be able to do with my grandkids, have them be able to harvest food from the garden, be interested in insects in the garden, where, you know, they're learning to identify birds in the garden. Um, I have blueberries out at the other side. So there's, there's a lot going on in a, in a third of an acre here. And, um, and it's done deliberately. Mm, sounds wonderful. So where can listeners contact you or attend your classes? And then how would they get information about Gateway Garden Center? Okay, so let's start with Gateway Garden Center. So I work at Gateway two days a week as the daily manager. And then I'm in and out because I work as a garden coach and do visits. And so you know, I'm constantly moving. Last year, I did 214 visits. Gateway's website is gatewaygardens.com, and that's gardens with an S. My personal contact information, um, should someone want me to do a talk, would be Nancy E. Bell. So it's Nancy E. for Ellen Bell at hotmail.com. And I do a lot of teaching at Mount Cuba Center, which is just a really good fit for me with my passion for native plants. Um, and I've got five more classes coming up uh, between now and June. And that's mountcuba.org.org yes. if they want to sign up and find those classes. And yes. any final thoughts for people exploring the world of native vines or wanting to add some to their gardens? 
um, don't feel like you have to get it right, right off the get go. Pick something that appeals to you and find the right spot for it in your garden. There are multiple, you know, you've got four sides to your house. You've got four different um, places that plants are going to want to live. And if something isn't thriving in a particular spot, feel free to move it. Um, you don't, the biggest thing is you don't have to get it perfect right out the get go. Just start and know that every step that you take um, in, in inviting native plants into your garden is a positive step into your local ecosystem. Great advice. Thank you so much, Nancy. You're welcome. My pleasure. Lungwort plant profile. Lungwort pulmonaria is a terrific perennial plant for shade but it can also take a good deal of sun. The plant prefers wet, humusy soil. It is quite drought tolerant once established, as long as you keep it well mulched. It awakens in early spring and has a long lasting bloom. The flowers are purple, pink, and blue. They somewhat resemble our native Virginia bluebell. The foliage ranges from plain green to silver spotted to frosted, almost totally silver. Its fuzzy leaves make it deer resistant. This is not a long lived plant. So every three to five years, dig up the clumps in fall and divide them. It is a smallish plant. So it does best situated in mass groupings or at the front of a border. Pair it with primrose, hosta, carex and hellebores, which grow in similar shade to part sun situations. Lungwort, you can grow that. going on in the garden this week? Well, over at the community garden plot, our carrot seedlings are up and the asparagus spears have made an appearance. We added seeds for dill, chamomile, and bloomsdale spinach this week. In my home garden, the bulbs are up from grape hyacinths to regular Dutch hyacinths to the early tulips, to the mid-season daffodils. Everything is looking fabulous, despite the tornado warnings, the deep freezes, and some crazy winds and rains this week. I didn't protect much, but everything seems to have come through just fine. In the local gardening world, the Franciscan Monastery Garden Guild is back with their sale again this year. That happens the weekend of Saturday, April 30th and Sunday, May 1st, and that's at Quincy Street in Washington, D.C. Um, they specialize in herbs and shrubs and roses. Go there for some fabulous plants and bargains. My own garden club, the Silver Spring Garden Club, is meeting back in person again, and we are at Brookside Gardens in Wheaton, Maryland. The date of our meeting is Monday, April 18th. Our speaker will start at 7.30 p.m. And that is friend of the show, Sherry Wilson. Her topic is plant this, not that. 50 plant swaps that will bring more birds, bees, and butterflies to your garden. And of course, her specialty is native plants. So she'll be suggesting native alternatives to invasive plants. You can find me at several upcoming events this spring, and those include the AHS River Farm Spring Garden Market on Friday and Saturday, April 8th and 9th. I'll have a booth at that. On Sunday, April 10th, I'll be at Homestead Gardens in Davidsonville, Maryland with my co-author Terry Spate talking about small space gardening. And Saturday, Sunday, April 23rd, 24th, I will have a booth space at the Leesburg Flower and Garden Festival. And then again, on Saturday, April 30th, at the Fona Garden Fair and Plant Sale, you can see me at the Washington Gardener Magazine booth. I hope to see you at one or maybe several of these events this spring. Happy gardening! If 
you're a crafty gardener like myself, I want to introduce you to Let's Make Art. I do a lot of DIY projects in the garden, from painting my garden gloves, to creating kokodama, to pouring my own stepping stones. And there's a company that can make it easier for you. Let's Make Art is a revolutionary crafting company that aims to help everyone to channel their inner artist, whether they're three or 63. With the assortment of products and subscription offers, there's an endless opportunity, fun and access to easy to understand tutorials and resources for everyone to learn a craft or take up a hobby. Anyone can have art supplies delivered right to their door in the form of monthly subscriptions, project kits, and supplies for a variety of activities. You can start learning basic lettering techniques to get your more familiar with your abilities with hand lettering for that garden journal you might be keeping. You can also shop all the best lettering supplies, boxes, and kits curated and approved by in-house artists. There's free weekly art journaling tutorials by art journaling artists and instructors. Everyone can join with their supplies at home. Grab the prepackaged kits or get all the videos first with an art journal box subscription. Learn from watercolor artists and instructors. Whether you're a total beginner or you've mastered the arts, Let's Make Art takes the guesswork out of watercolor and creates easy and fun kits. The only thing you'll need is a brush. Let's Make Art simple together. Check out Let's Make Art today by going to our special link zen.ai forward slash garden dc that's zen.ai forward slash garden dc happy crafting in the new book the urban garden by kathy jensen and terry spite you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers shrubs vegetables herbs and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. The Urban Garden, 101 Ways to Grow Food and Beauty in the City, comes out this spring. You can pre-order it now at Amazon.com and Bookshop.org. Thank you for listening to Garden D.C., you can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash gardendc slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.